Ministerially speaking, a few minutes. Amen. I was amazed this morning that I preached as long as I did. I do not apologize for it, but I was shocked. I thought I just preached about 10 minutes. I had a rough Saturday. Got stung by some yellow jackets in the head. Took some Benadryl. Was droggy. That's why I fell asleep during my own message this morning. Apologize for that. No, not really. I didn't fall asleep, but I felt a little weary, and uh, tonight I'm over it, thank God. But you know something, I'm nervous. You wouldn't think that after uh, 8,000 messages behind this pulpit that I'd be nervous. But this topic tonight is one that I don't want to mess up, and I want to be accurate, and I want to uh, be a help and an encouragement so very much, more than you know, more than you know. And... Um, I want to preach a message entitled, When Bad Things Happen to Godly People. When Bad Things Happen to Godly People. Hebrews chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, let's stand in awe of the Word of God. And we'll start with verse 30 and read through verse 39, and then that'll prelude Hebrews 11, of course. And I hope that you'll get something out of this message. I don't know if you've ever um, prayed for something. And the opposite happened. I don't know if you've ever had something happen and you didn't understand why it happened. I have and you have and we all have. And the temptation is to throw in the towel. And the temptation is almost to say, Lord, why? And I don't believe God minds you asking why. He said, ask for wisdom. He'd give it to you liberally. But I want to tell you something. Sometimes... We don't know why. And it's a mystery. But the Bible says in verse 30, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Can somebody say amen right there? And some people just feel, just act towards the church and God like there is no God, but i got another thought coming. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me and my bonds. And I believe that's why this is Paul speaking by the Holy Spirit. And took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better 
and an enduring substance. Thank God for heaven. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he shall come, he, he shall he shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Thank God. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then you know the rest of the chapter about the great victories and the great hall of fame and the, and the great blessings. And I think one of the greatest verses that you could ever read is verse 6 where it says, But without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God, what a great privilege to pray, must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. By faith Noah, being warned of God, the things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heirs of righteousness. He goes on to mention uh, Abraham. He goes on to mention Isaac and Jacob. In verse 11, Sarah. I'm telling you, friend, here's a hall of fame of faith. Then he gets to Abraham again. And thank God he gets to, he gets to um, Joseph. And then Jacob. And then Moses. And on and on he goes, and then he runs out of time, and he's like a good preacher, he says in closing, and preaches another 30 minutes, and he says this, And what shall I say to more? For the time would fail me to tell you of Gideon and Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, we're in verse 32 please, of David also, Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Then I want you to notice this. And others. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in the desert, in the mountains, in the dens, in the caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise in their lifetime. But it says, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 13. One more verse, please. One more verse. Verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For He has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture that not only brings out the victorious in the eyes of men, the conquerors, those that overcame, but also, dear God, those that overcame privately, but Lord, they suffered. And they were beaten, they were abused, they were thrown into prison, and they suffered. Lord, dear God, help us to realize why you and your providence and in your power and in your plan and your purpose allow some to suffer. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you'd help us not to question you, but God, just to be encouraged that you're still in control. And Lord, it's not the last chapter. But God, you're going to work a great work in all the tribulations and trials and injustices that we go through in this life. 
Lord, please speak to our hearts. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. About 15 years ago, maybe 20, a man come into our church in a wheelchair. This man was a great construction worker. Put his picture up, brother. A great construction worker, and he was um, uh, a master carpenter. And I saw this today on Facebook. I wasn't on Facebook. It just happened to jump off the page across my mind. And this guy's name is Brian Stewart. This is Andrea Gardner's daddy. He was six foot up on a scaffold. He was working. He fell backwards. And when he fell backwards, what happened was he snapped his spinal cord and he was paralyzed from the neck down. Now I want to tell you something, friend. This man of God was faithful in his church. He taught Sunday school. He was a deacon. He's still now very active, you can see, in the ministry down at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Columbus, Georgia. He, uh, he uh, does great things on the internet like uh, oversee uh, covenant eyes. And uh, when people want to sign up to be checked and accountable, here he is in his wheelchair making sure they stay on the right page. And I like that. Amen. I think every Christian ought to have it. But I want to tell you something, friend. Here's a picture of a man that uh, bad things happened to him when he was godly. I think about John Wesley White. Billy Graham said he was the greatest orator, preacher that ever walked this earth. And One day he had a stroke. He couldn't speak. His dear friend called him up and he said he could only say one word. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. The great orator, John Wesley White, evangelist that covered all of America, was limited to one word for many years. Yes, yes, yes. You can take it down, brother. I think about just a few months ago, I attended a funeral over at Liberty Baptist Church. My dear friend, Kevin Gardner, that was raised in this church, his dear wife, I saw the picture yesterday of that little blonde-haired little girl giving a kiss to her mother. It must have been a fair or something. I couldn't tell what it was. The day would have been her birthday. Here's Kevin sitting at home one block up the road, going to church by himself, getting kids ready, Norris and Renee, who are members of our church many years, trying to help the best they can. Some of you say, why would God allow that? She's probably 33, 34. I think about Gary Ledford, most gracious, humble man you'll ever meet. Now he's got liver failure, very weak. I've never seen him say one bad word about anyone, a godly preacher. I think about several years ago when Miss Carol McNeese came down with MS. And Brother Johnny was devastated, sang the solo in our choir. After a while, we'll understand why. Miss Carol was so shy that when I'd walk down the aisle, I'd see her duck into a Sunday school class so she wouldn't have to speak to me. She was this shy. But she was a beautiful young lady that could sing, and we had her sing often. I think about George W. Truett, a great Southern Baptist preacher that shot his best friend and killed him on a hunting trip as the shotgun got hung up on the barbed wire. Why? I think about Edith, Edith Howitt. His brother accidentally, the gun went off. I wish he was here tonight. He almost lost his leg. And I think about some missionaries that Thursday they put on a post, today our baby would have been full term. She's in England. They're in England as missionaries. They're right in the middle of God's will. And she miscarried her baby just a month ago. I think about Sammy Ritchie coming home from a Bible study, goes to sleep. 
wakes up and sees he's in the wrong lane and swerves off to the side of the road. And a, a family from Virginia, going to Virginia on Highway 301 did the same thing. They met head on off the road. And he was killed as it snapped his neck. Why, God? Well, I know why on that one because our preacher's son was lost and going to hell and probably would be there today. And he got saved at the funeral. And you know something? It's hard to get preacher boys lost. I think about Roy Gentry. I've been pastoring up at uh, Dogwood Valley Baptist Church for 46 years, I believe. A man of God. A great church. He backed up over his daughter and killed her in the driveway. Why? I think about John Bunyan, imprisoned, beat, spent many years in prison. He wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, one of the greatest books besides the Bible that a Christian could read. I'm telling you, friend, there's a lot of things happen that we have no answer. Three weeks ago, Connie and I were in the Erlanger Hospital and I walked in the room and there was Philip. He said, she's, she's, she's down trying to get some nerve block. They forgot to give her a nerve block and she's in such agony and pain. And then here she comes in about 30 minutes later and she has that smile upon her face. She's so glad to see Miss Connie. She didn't say much to me. But she was so glad to see Miss Connie. Where is she tonight? My nursery? Uh, so glad to see Miss Connie. I like to know when my wife skips church. But anyway. So glad to see Miss Connie, and she begins to, she begins to uh, rejoice, and, and she's talking about uh, what kind of prosthetic that she wants, one that bends and, 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 and she can run around the camp on and that she can serve those meals with, and she has such a sweet spirit. Why did God allow that? She's going to her mother's funeral. Philip's supposed to preach it. And a lady's trying to get the GPS to talk to her in a different language. Swerves, hits her head on, and half her leg goes through the dash. They put it back together. She agonizes in pain for a solid year. And now they take her leg. Why? What, what, what good is this, you might say? Folks, I want to tell you something. These Christians in chapter 10 of... Of, of the book of Hebrews were scorned, they were reproached, and folks, they were, they were uh, uh, confiscated all they had, they suffered economically. The Bible says in, uh, 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 they were a gazing stock, verse 33, look with me please. And folks, it says they lost their substance. But they have better and more enduring substance. They're in bonds, they took joy for the spoiling of your goods. In other words, the government took everything they had for being a Christian. The religious crowd jumped them, and persecuted them. In verse 35, the Bible says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. So you've got to get the context of Hebrews chapter 11, which is Hebrews chapter 10, of course, and the key is, verse 38, it says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall not have pleasure in him. Folks, there's only one way to please God. It's by faith. And let me just say the whole crux of the matter, and I'll try to be brief tonight since I kept you so long this morning. The whole reason for our tribulations and trials is that God would get glory and that our faith would endure. And folks, He exhorts them not to quit. The just shall live by faith, the Bible says. And if you draw back, you cannot please God. In Hebrews chapter 11, He goes on and talks about these great men of faith, these great ladies of faith. And He says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Come to Him, believing that He is. And here's the danger of it all. Don't base your theology on circumstances. Don't ever base your theology on circumstances. If you do, you might pre-conclude 
that God doesn't care. God doesn't love you. God's not concerned with the mess I'm in. But He is. And He's got a plan. He's got a purpose that's far above all that we could ever think about. Now let me ask you a question. I want you to be real honest. Not out loud, please. You ever prayed for something that you really wanted and you endeavored to trust God for it with all your heart and you didn't get what you wanted? Matter of fact, it got worse. Has anybody ever been there? Have you prayed and asked God for healing? And you got sicker! You ever prayed and asked God for money? And you got poor. Have you ever asked God to get you out of some difficulty? And you got into greater difficulty. Maybe some nice single person prayed and that that guy would notice you and you fell in love with, with him and he went off and married your best friend and acts like he don't even know you. That's grounds for bitterness. Say amen right there. Maybe you planned a Sunday school picnic and it rained. And you prayed it wouldn't rain. Does that mean that God has forsaken you? Does that mean that God doesn't care? Does that mean that your faith has failed? And you want to blame it on yourself? Chapter 10, folks, sets the setting for chapter 11. And the book of chapter 11 is the hall of fame of faith. And boy, it gets going real good about Noah. What a man of faith. Never rained before. God spared the whole world, his whole family through him. Nobody else would listen. Abraham, praise God, Moses. All the victory is there. But I thank God the Lord warns us about something in the last few verses. He says, but there were some. There were some. I want you to take three things down and take it down personally. And if you have to take notes, go ahead and take it, because a lot of times you remember eight times better if you'll write it down. But number one, strong faith realizes the power of God. We believe God can do anything, amen? I love the stories of Daniel in the lion's den. And don't read between the lines, amen? And da da Daniel was a great man of faith. And he stood the test. Hey, his friends, the three Hebrew ch children. Folks, there's some lessons learned in that furnace that nobody else... And there was someone seen in the furnace that they'd have never seen if, if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I wish I knew their real names, would, had recanted, quit, and pouted, and panicked, and not prayed, and praised God anyway. We think about Peter being delivered in Acts chapter 12 when he knocked on the door of the prayer meeting and the little girl comes to the door and she goes back and says, Peter's at the door. And they said, hey, you're crazy. Get out of here, kid. He said, no, he's right out there. They're praying for him to be delivered, but, but when he's delivered, they don't believe it. God answers prayer. Sometimes when we don't even believe it. And folks, we experience miracles in our little old lives. How many's ever experienced a financial miracle? Raise your hand. Amen. I'm going to tell you what the financial miracle is. You're working right now. Say amen. A lot of people aren't. I saw a guy the other day living in a box. And he was walking. I got three vehicles in my car, in my driveway. None of them are fancy, but it sure beats a bicycle. Say amen. I'm past that stuff. Sure beats walking. I left the driveway and said, boy, I'm blessed. There's old Pappy's truck. He gave it to me. I didn't have to pay for it. Praise God. I mean, it's a nice little truck. It's falling apart, but it's a good truck. It's good for garbage. It's good for trash. It's good for hauling. It's good for roll down the windows and lower up your sleeve and act like you're something. Amen. It's a good little old truck. I'm blessed. How many of you have been, there's been a miracle domestically in your life? You're still married. 
And looking at some of you, it's a miracle of God she stayed with you. <laughs> Endurance to the end, praise God, hallelujah. How many's had a prayer answered? This very week, this very day. But how many of you, God said no. Or God said, I've got a better plan. Or wait a while. And then I'll move. Most of us are so instant. We're so instant. We want instant news. We've got five channels to prove it. We want instant grits. We want instant rice. We want everything now. And we want it yesterday if it's not, not too inconvenient. We just want it now. And I don't, I don't blame you when you're going through trials and tribulation. You're suffering. You're going through chem chemo every day your insides are being burned out you want some relief now your family's in turmoil that's on the verge of divorce you want help now your kids are going off into sin and drugs and, and rebellion you want some help now and I know it's an urgent prayer but sometimes God says I've got another plan He don't plan anybody living in sin but I'm going to tell you something folks God does not always answer in our time. Number two, strong faith recognizes the purpose of God. Strong faith recognizes the purpose of God. In verse 35 of Hebrews chapter 11, real quick now, I'm going to close in just a few minutes. This will be a very brief message with a point. In Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 35 through 38. The Bible says, Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tor tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trials of cruel mocking and scourging, yet moreover bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and coat skins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. God doesn't always have your purpose in mind, He has His purpose in mind. And His purpose sometimes is not to always deliver us in our time. These love God too. Hey, these believe God also, or they wouldn't be in this chapter. And some... I mean, the hall of fame of faith, here's those that haven't been delivered. Here's those that haven't been healed. And here's those that were persecuted. They love God too. And it's so quick people to judge somebody when something goes wrong. They say, oh, it must be like Job, Job's friends. It must be some real sin in their life. And God help you if you're a judge. You need to be as a brother or sister in Christ. Look through the Bible, some of the choice saints. Zechariah was stoned. Jeremiah was thrown in a pit, and he cried so much, he was called the weeping prophet, and he wanted to quit, but he said, I can't quit because the word was burning in my bones. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Isaiah was sawed in half, put in a tree trunk and sawed in half. Stephen was stoned. Some died in Colosseums, food for lions, objects of entertainment. It's amazing, this uh, full contact, no glove boxing. Everybody likes that. You know why? Because somebody's blood and teeth are slinging out the, 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 the blooming ring. And everybody loves it. Kill him. Don't just knock him out. Just go ahead and let him bleed. Y'all love it. Come on. Some of you wives, y'all can't stand it when the husband turns that junk on. But it's blood, guts, and gore. And I'm going to tell you something, friend. In the name of Christianity, here is people that were entertained as they soaked the sand of the arenas with their blood as people cheered and laughed and, 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 and was entertained by lines being sought after, uh, seeking after... Um, uh, Christians in the name of judgment and imprisonment. And gladiators fully armed, slaying Christians. And they became destitute. They became lonely. 
They, they hid in the catacombs. And folks, listen, did they not love God? Did they not believe God? This is the crowd that Paul's speaking to in Hebrews 10. Many want to recant. Many want to just throw in the towel. But he said, hey, please keep the faith. And don't get your theology from circumstances. Sooner or later, you ask God, maybe this question, Lord, do you really care? Are you really there? Gideon said the same thing. Look at uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 12 and 13, please. Joshua judges Ruth. Look at Judges chapter 6. Please stay with me just a few more minutes. Verses 12 through 13. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And look at, uh, and Gideon said unto him, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then has all this befallen us? Folks, Gideon just had enough guts to say what we've all thought. Come on. He says, where be all the, his miracles which our father told us of? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us? Gideon saying, the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Mennonites. Praise God, things changed when he met the captain of the host. And the, and the war was on, and there wasn't a, a, a bow that was slung or a rock that was thrown. They just shouted and praised God, and the walls came tumbling down. Folks, listen. That was Joshua, excuse me. Gideon was a man of vi- valor, but he was honest enough to say this. Lord, where's the miracles? And Why in the world? Are we in this kind of shape? John chapter 11. Turn with me there. Verse 14. They prayed that Jesus would be where Lazarus is and raise him from the dead. And Jesus had the most unusual response. He said, he's dead and I'm glad. Look at John 11 verse just verse 14, please. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And look at what Jesus said. And I am glad for your sake, for your sake, that I was not there to intend you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go on unto him. He says, I've got, some other, I've got something in, in mind. Difficult times does not mean God has abandoned you. I believe if we turn to Hebrews chapter 13, after hearing this testimony of those that did not get delivered, those that died for the faith, those that were in prison and hungry, destitute and afflicted and tormented for the faith, then we come to the conclusion of the whole matter. In verse 5 it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content from such things you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The word in the Greek for never is never, 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 never. It's five times stronger than our word never. And folks, I want you to know that he never, 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 never will leave you. And he'll never forsake you. I want to close with two examples from the Bible that I pray will help you. Number one, John the Baptist. In John chapter 1, he is crying out with a pulpit next to the the river Jordan. He's baptizing people and he looks up and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Powerful preaching. Then he says, Repent or he's going to judge you. Powerful preaching. He's preaching Christ who has power. A Christ who's going to judge. And then in Matthew chapter 11, something very, very unusual happens. And that's why you should never judge anyone that cries out, Lord, why? Because John not only asks why, he asks, who are you, God? 
Who are you, Jesus? Matthew chapter 11, he's in jail. He's, he's going to his death. He's going to be beheaded. And Matthew chapter 11, verse 4, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. He said, John the Baptist is asking you, Should we seek another? Who is, art thou, that, uh, in verse three, 3, he says, and he said to him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Are you really Jesus? Are you really the Christ? I mean, John the Baptist. Jesus said he was the greatest woman born, greatest man born of woman. He was, a, he was the greatest man born of woman, according to Jesus. Verse 11, Verily I say unto you, among them which are born of women, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist. But then he goes in and classifies and said, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And so folks, here he is. He's in jail. He's doubting. Don't ever, don't ever condemn someone that doubts. Just pray for them, they'll come out of it. And he goes on, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. And the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Keep on believing, John. And I could release you in a second, but it's not God's will. I have a bigger purpose, John. He was saying, if you're all powerful, God, then get me out of here. Haven't we prayed that? I have. And John the Baptist almost lost his faith. Matter of fact, he sent the message and said, Jesus, are you really who you are or do we need to look for another one? Whew. And that was honest doubt. And I want to tell you something. He honestly came to Jesus and Jesus gave him an honest answer. He says, hey, tell him. I'm the one that was... It's caused the blind to receive their sight, the lame to walk, uh, walk, the lepers to cleanse, and the deaf to hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Isn't it great that he said the gospel preached to him was just as good as raising the dead? And that's why Jesus came, amen. The only reason he raised the dead and, made, and worked miracles was to verify who he was. But you have honest doubts. You have honest answers from God. Jesus answered and said to him, Go show John and go tell John I'm who I say I am. Folks, mature faith recognizes the purpose of God. That's not always easy. It's one thing to have faith that escapes, but it's another thing to have faith that endures. It's one thing to have faith that delivers, but it's another thing to have faith to die in. Stephen died by faith. I close with this. In Acts 6, the Bible describes Stephen, the preaching deacon. We got some preaching deacons around here, amen? And teaching deacons, and I appreciate every one of them. But the Bible describes him and the other first deacons that serve tables as men of full of faith. Full of faith. It was faith that allowed him to preach such a message. Turn to Acts chapter 7. And folks, he, he skit their hide. He got them so mad, they started gnawing on his arm. A friend of mine, put something dirty on Facebook, but don't gnaw my arm, praise God. Don't bite at me. Don't claw my eyes out. They got so mad, uh, they said he blasphemes. And they called him and brought him to the council. And folks, I want to tell you something. He began to preach. And he preached with power. He preached with accuracy. And I want to tell you something. Folks, he preached and he called them stiff, stiff neck, uncircumcised, and heart ears. Do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Verse 51. He says, just like you unbelieving parents. And he stands there by faith. He preaches by faith. And then they begin to stone him. And I believe with all my heart, all Stephen had to do was say, 
Well, I recant everything I just said. I can't stand these stones. I can't stand this hurt. I can't stand this pain. And so I think I'm mistaken. I don't think I don't th- I don't think I don't think I was accurate. I don't think Jesus is the Son of God, but He stood there with faith, and those stones pulverized his skin. He bled out. He didn't recant. He didn't renounce. He accepted what God gave him. The big question is, do you have faith to heal you? The big question is not do you have faith to be healed. Here's the bigger miracle. You have faith not to be healed and still praise God. There's the bigger miracle. Folks, anybody can be healed if it's God's will. But when God chooses not to heal you of that cancer you're carrying in your body right now, do you have faith to praise Him anyway? And here's another question. And this is the, this is the, the crescendo of Hebrews chapter 11. Others had faith to suffer. Others had faith to love God and believe God just as much as the ones that were victorious and was delivered. These were not delivered. These were not victorious in the eyes of the world. They were. And it's not that God cannot. He just chose not to. And He had a purpose. Stephen was stoned to death. And by faith, he died. And nobody else could understand it. But God understood it. Because the very person that was inspired to write this book, which a lot of people debate that he wrote this book, Hebrews, was standing in the shadows. Thank you for that song. He was standing with his cloak. He was consenting unto his death. His name was Saul. Later to become Paul and write most of our New Testament. And here's a deacon that had enough faith to die. But God had a plan. And so strong faith believes in the power of God. Strong faith believes in the the purpose of God. In the book of Acts, Peter was miraculously delivered but James's head was cut off. You explain to me why Peter was released and James died. Did God love Peter more than he did James? I don't think so. You have to read the entire chapter of Hebrews chapter 11 to find the last point. But I just want to give you the last two verses. Strong faith remembers the promises of God. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11, last two verses, and we'll close. It says, In whom the world was not worthy, I'll wait on you. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves and the earth. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Then. But look at verse 40. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Folks, strong faith remembers the promises of God. Verse 39 and 40 does not mean that they're they're not going to keep His promise. God's promises are always on time. And let me say this, they're always on His schedule. They promised Abraham the land of Cana. He never saw it. Yet. Promise that the meek will shut and shall inherit the earth. We ain't seen that because we're not. Hey, listen, the prince and power of the world is having a havoc in this day. I want to tell you something. The reason a lot of good people have a lot of trouble because we live in a corrupt, cursed, sin cursed world. And I want to tell you something. You can drive down the road and a drunk can knock you off the road. And folks, don't blame God for that. Say amen right there. We live in a wicked society. We live in an unjust society. We live in a society that the church is under attack. And it's going to get worse. Hatred's on the throne. Injustice. 
and truth have fallen in the streets, but Jesus still reigns. He'll keep His promise. One day, He'll come. One day, He'll fulfill every promise. And folks, the Bible just tells us to keep on rejoicing. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Just keep on rejoicing. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. I ain't got time to go over it. You read it yourself. It says, keep on looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Don't consider Him lest you faint and get weary in your mind. You get discouraged and depressed. And then Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12 through 15. Just be encouraged and don't get bitter. He said, wherefore lift up thy hands which hang down. Hebrews 12, 12. And the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let rather be healed. Fall of peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Look diligently, lest any man fell of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Folks, every time I read chapter Acts chapter 7, and every time I read Hebrews chapter 11, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged to know that I can have faith to believe He's powerful. He can do anything He wants to. I have faith to believe that He has got a purpose. It's far above me. I can't figure it out. I can't trace it. All I can do is submit and say, God, have your will, and please give me the grace to go on. If you don't heal me from cancer, I'll still praise you. If you take my leg off because a lady's looking at a GPS, I'll still walk for you. And if I'm paralyzed from the neck down, I'll still serve God in my church as a faithful deacon. That's the yieldedness. And that's the belief that we need. And then last but not least, strong faith believes in the promises of God. Folks, He's coming again. If it gets any worse, I don't know if we can take it. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. The Lord's coming, and boy, is He hot. And He's going to set this thing straight once and for all. I'm glad that I can have faith in God in these last wicked and perverse days. And then when something bad happens to me, I don't plan on recanting. I don't plan on pouting and panicking and quitting and getting out of the ministry. I just plan on believing God and praying for grace to go on anyway. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you used the tragedies in Sammy Ritchie's life to reach my preacher's son. Thank you, Lord, for using the tragedy in Roy Gentry's life to keep on preaching all these years. Thank you, dear God, the Vanderhurts are still over in England after losing their precious baby who had been born yesterday. God, thank you for what you're doing in Ethan's life. God, as he's surrendered to preach and now he's engaged. Thank you, Lord, for how you use Carol McNeese's life in our lives. Thank you, dear God, how you're using Gary Ledford's life in my life. God, thank you for what you're doing through Kevin Gardner and Norris and Renee. God, thank you. Thank you, dear God, for dear friends of mine that's been through some very terrible disappointments. God, I appreciate that they're still believing. They're still trusting you. They're still serving you. And they're still asking God to increase their faith to go on anyway. God, help us. God, help us to have faith in God and please you no matter what. And Lord, I know there's many here that are heartbroken over what sin has done in their lives. Sin has done in their families' lives. How people have done things that's just unfathomable to them. And God, they're hurting right now. But God, you can give them grace. You can give them peace. Lord, you can even give them joy to trust you that you have a plan that might 
just reach another Paul Farsight Jr. Or someone lost in a cult. Or someone that's going to hell. And oh God, use us to be proof positive evidence that you're still on the throne and you still love us. <coughs> and you still have a plan for our life. We're not in charge of, but you are. Lord, thank you for increasing our faith tonight. I don't have the answer. I don't know why. But God, I know you do. And Lord, we must put the whole circumstance and the whole situation.